Thanks a lot. So I'm Chris Bond, and I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship and the cloud. And I'm here to do that because I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had, I built two businesses, one in production and one in technology, servicing a lot of client customers that are here today. So I'm going to, now I'm at Amazon. The first thing I want to talk about is this word SMB, which refers to, a lot of people refer to it as a small, medium business. And that's, that's what everybody starts when they get into an industry, whether you're, you're, a, you're Amazon or you're Autodesk. You start off as a small business, right? Well, actually, what it really stands for is soup, macaroni, and maybe beer. And it stands for that because it's really hard to start your small business. My first small business you know, started off with my credit card, a loan for my friend for 7,500 bucks, and just me. So let's talk about what the opportunity was. So I was an artist working at a company in the 90s doing a whole bunch of multimedia projects, some visualization for architecture, some rendering, lots of flying logos in the 90s. There was lots and lots of flying logos. If anyone's familiar with that time period in the 90s, a lot of computer graphics rendering and visualization were done on SGIs. Those are silicon graphics workstations, and they're very expensive. So what happened? Well, I saw this. So is anyone familiar with these? These are Autodesk's first 3D projects for rendering and visualization, 3D Studio for DOS, version one and two. And when these came out, I saw an opportunity, and the opportunity was, well, I don't have to spend 60 or $90,000 on an SGI. I don't have to spend $30,000 on a crazy product. I can buy this and have a Windows PC. And so at the time, the company I worked at was also a PC builder, and we had a lot of those lying around. So I said, hey, let's, let's move into this more. We started doing a lot of television production, commercials, and that sort of thing. Um, so I came up with a business plan. So I worked at this company. I said, you know, we can use this software. We proved it. You know, we're doing websites and small renders, lots of flying logos. But I said, hey, let's start a business focused on doing content rendering for customers, whether it's architecture, engineering customers, uh, television commercials, or even maybe one day movies. And I presented this business plan internally at the company I worked for, and they said it was impossible. It could never happen in a place like Winnipeg. So I'm from a place, Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Canada. It's very cold. And so the very next day, I resigned, and I started my business. And within the first year, I hit my plan. So let's transition a little bit. So <clears throat> I built this company at the time, and we were, it was just me in a room for basically the first year. And we started doubling and tripling. We opened an office in, in Sydney, in Vancouver, in the US. We had to buy infrastructure, tools, and all those sort of things. Because our customer, our, our work looks something like this. And this was for creating content for film, but it's very similar to creating renderings, whether you're fosters and partners, whoever, because you're, you're, you're taking information from your set or your location, whether it's LiDAR data, whether it's photographs, you're bringing in the layout, you're designing everything, you're doing camera animation, and you're rendering. And I've highlighted these gray areas here as part of the workflow because this is the key component of what the expense was at the time. You know, this took a lot of rendering power, and all of these phases took rendering. So normally, you'd expect a workflow to look like this, but the reality is that it actually looks like this. So every time, and I've just highlighted lighting and rendering here, every time you need to make an iteration, you go back to the customer, you have a design change in the building or infrastructure, you have to build a new model, you have to change the texture, you're adjusting the lighting, if there's any rigging, any mechanics, you know, doors or windows opening or closing or characters walking through, any animation iterations, you have to continually go back to lighting and rendering. So you're doing this step a bazillion times. And if that step takes a lot of time, computationally, it takes hundreds of hours, uh, thousands of hours, then, then you're waiting a long time. So, so I did some discovery. So in my first business, we were the customer. We did a lot of visual effects rendering for films and work for customers. Once we sold that company, the second one uh, was built on te making technology for companies. So I took a, a, a database shot of their production rendering. So we have a render product called Deadline that we that we created at the time. 
And in this, this is one day at a studio, one of our customers. So the vertical on the left is the time, amount of time people are waiting, and that caps off at 24 hours. There's a lot of renders where artists were waiting 36, 48 hours. These are simulations, they're renders. And across the bottom is the number of submissions over a day. So you can see that their on-premise infrastructure, of which they have thousands of computers in their organization, is, is still not enough to allow feedback on a continual basis. So if you look here, the blue is when basically the entire infrastructure is swamped. The orange is the amount of time artists are waiting. And so they would not get individual results back for 24 hours. So if you go back to that previous image here, you can imagine the amount of return. And this is why when I built my first business, we had to buy a lot of computers. We had a lot of artists, and they're always waiting, and we didn't want them to wait, so we had to buy infrastructure. And of course, that infrastructure was in Winnipeg, Vancouver, Los Angeles, Sydney. And then when we were acquired, you figure that, like, well, somebody else is going to take care of that, right? Well, not really the case. Now we were more global, and we had infrastructure everywhere. And of course, that meant cooling and storage and everything. So now I work at Amazon, and I see the infrastructure that we have, and I think, what happens if we change this process? And we say, well, I want every artist, every engineer to get back their result within a maximum of two hours. So I did that across the bottom, it's the same number of jobs. The amount of time waiting is now capped at four hours at the top. So most of the work is getting back within two hours, most of it far faster. And what I did was say, I'm going to make everything elastic. So the compute goes up across the top, up to 1,800 instances, and that's like 70,000 cores at any one time being applied to these simulation requests. And so just by taking their, their uh, rendering process, their compute, and making it elastic, we're allowing every artist to get their result back faster. So what does that do to a company? How does that change the workflow? What happens when an artist or an engineer isn't waiting a day or two days or three days? How much faster can you iterate? And to put this in perspective, for this organization to absorb this amount of computation in one day on premise, they would have to have over 12,000 machines with 36 cores. With, on AWS, the rendering would actually cost less than one of the machines. So they can experiment and grow. And so to me, this is the new opportunity from an entrepreneurial perspective. In the old days, I saw a business that I built and grew. Our, our revenue growth was over 25x over four or five years. We grew from one person to 125. We were acquired. And that opportunity was based on the single idea of we can provide the same quality of work for our customers using Windows machines and 3D Studio from Autodesk as our competitors could do by buying these massive SGI computers and infrastructure. And it succeeded. The opportunity now is, I don't think you have to buy the computers at all. The software is available on the cloud. The machines are available on the cloud. And that's the new opportunity. And so if I was an entrepreneur today, well, I'm still an entrepreneur, but I sold my second company to Amazon. So I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur within Amazon. If, if I if I was starting a new business today, if I started a new studio, a content creation, a studio that makes things, I would do it all in the cloud. And so I've got some great customer stories about that, but I'm gonna go through sort of the reasons and outline them why I would. The first is, you can build it as you go. You pay for it as you go. So one of my customers right now is rendering in the cloud, and they scaled up to about 30,000 cores, that's 1,000 machines, just the other morning. And he said the best thing about it was he could turn it off. So at the end of the day, it was gone. And he didn't need to like bring in equipment, bring in cooling, all that kind of stuff. He didn't need space or storage, it just happened. The other thing is, is that you're global by default. So when I built a business, and we had to go to the customer, you know, there's a lot of film production in Vancouver, we had uh, people in London because we had customers like Fosters and Partners. You know, we, we had to build an infrastructure in all of those places. So we had to have a building, we had to have a lease, we had to have equipment, we had to have desks, and so on. And nowadays, you know, we've got customers that use our products and services that are completely virtual. So we have a great customer called Theory Studios out of Orlando, Florida. 
Uh, they scaled up to do a television production, and they're doing a lot of rendering. And they had up to 36 artists all around the US. And all of them worked from home. And so they worked on their own workstation or laptop that they owned. They signed in and stored all their data on the cloud. And then they rendered together. And the interesting part of the story is that a hurricane happened while they were in production. So the main founder of this organization is based out of Orlando, and he ran out of power. And he actually had to evacuate his family. And he could do so knowing that his entire production was actually still working. So if he was trying to deliver that show and that key shots at that time, you know, he might have tried to stay behind. He might have put his family and, and employees at risk, or he might have lost the, the job. And in this case, because it's global, because these instances are in the cloud and they're anywhere you want to be, you can just turn them on and get them. And so ultimately, that's the story I wanted to say, is that when I was starting businesses, you know, I branched out and created this organization in my first business around the world to hire talent, work with our customers face to face, et cetera. In my second company, Thinkbox, I, I had, I think, half my workforce working remotely from home around the world for the same reason. I wanted to work with key people that I had a relationship with. They didn't necessarily want to like move to Winnipeg, right? So I could have them work out of Toronto, Vancouver, Austin, Seattle, London, et cetera. And they could work anywhere they wanted to. And secondly, it's about the customers, right? So when you're, when you're thinking about your new business or how you might start out or, or branch out into another market, you can be there with them virtually incredibly easy with the power of the cloud. So that's my, that's my simple story.